Colossians 1, and if you find verse number 15, if you'll stand with me as we'll read through uh, verses 15 down through verse number 20 this morning of Colossians chapter number 1, the idea of Savior Supreme. Paul is writing, he's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says in verse number 15, "...who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth." Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. And here's the part where we struggle and for him. So verse number 17, and he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him, that's in Christ, should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Let's ask the Lord for his help. Lord, thank you for being ultimately and ever supreme. Forgive us for where we, um, in our own life, to, to use the phrase to dethrone you, I think is, is as best maybe we can do. Certainly you're, you're king and reign forever and ever. But Lord, in our life, we don't follow you as best we should because we can very easily lose sight of the fact that you are to be supreme in our life. So help us as we enter into this new year, may we ask ourselves and honestly evaluate, may we ask that the Holy Spirit would go as the psalmist and as the, the, the book of Proverbs talks about, that candle that goes through our innermost being and, and revealing things that need to be changed or swept away or done away with. And Lord, we'll be very grateful. Would you please be preeminent, be, be supreme in our life because it will change how we live and if there is someone here today that's never trusted Christ, may they take this last Sunday of 2018, Lord, no better day to do it than today. May they trust Christ as their personal Savior, have their sins forgiven, and a home given to them by, by your grace and your love. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. It is interesting to know the background of uh, certain biblical books and to, to know... And what was going on, what was kind of the makeup of the, the audience or the crowd, so to speak? I think that helps in the context of the passage to, to be able to understand and, and to properly interpret the passage. And the city of Colossae, where Paul writes uh, this letter to the Colossian uh, Christians, because of where it was located, it was, it was susceptible to all kinds of new ideas and an influx of new teaching and philosophies and religious beliefs that had come from both the western part of the world and the east. Uh, Colossae sat is, is kind of a crossroads, if you will, or where two roads met at the same place. And so you've got uh, ideas and philosophies and worldviews coming from the eastern part of the world. And it's... Uh, going to the western part, uh, if you will, and, and those in the west are going to the east. And, and as we, let me turn this mic on, how about that? That'll help. As we uh, come to Colossae, then those ideas and those uh, mindsets, those uh, worldviews are coming into one place. And what it was doing was it was beginning to affect the Christian worldview, or the Christian philosophy in this city of Colossae. And so at the time of writing the book of Colossians, the church was dealing with a certain brand, if you will, of false teachers. And we've talked about it on Sunday evenings in our study of 1 John. But these, those Gnostic believers, uh, I should say Gnostic people, were teachers, were, were coming into the church and they were trying to pull influence away from the church, from uh, the leadership, from, from uh, Christ being the center or being preeminent in the churches. They were trying to pull influence away. They were uh, preaching a sense of a false morality. In other words, if it feels good, it's okay because your flesh is just flesh and you can't do anything about it. And, and so because of that, really what matters is on the inside. So you can kind of live any old way you want and you can feed your flesh and, and you can, uh, if it feels good, do it because, well, God made your flesh. And, uh, you know, what really matters is what God has already done on the inside. Well, that's... That's nothing what the Bible says. It's not Bible preaching. It's not Bible teaching. It's not Scripture in any form or any imagination. But I think as we, we think about the, the idea of different philosophies and mindsets and worldviews, 
I think it's easy for us who, who are Christian people to get into, and again, because it's the new year and we're thinking about uh, maybe some resolutions or some goals, and we talked a little bit about that in the Sunday school hour, but we can get into a routine in living our Christian life. We just, we go Sunday to Sunday to Sunday to Sunday, and we, we are in danger of thinking, well, if I, if I do certain things, then um, people will like me or respect me. Uh, the people at church, they will, they will have a good opinion of me. I will feel good about myself because heaven knows I need other people to feel good about me if I'm going to feel good about myself. And then also, well, God, you know, he'll probably be pleased with me too if I, just, if I continue doing these, these things. Well, what Paul is telling this church at Colossae and these, these Colossian Christians is he's saying it was his duty given to him by Almighty God to preach and to elevate the Lord Jesus Christ. He understood, he knew the importance of being Christ-like in his own life. And he knew what, what that uh, meant. He knew the victory that it meant in his own life. He, he knew and understood the power that he had experienced and, and as he had watched God work in his own life. And so what he wants these people at Colossae to understand is, okay, you're getting all these other influences and all these other worldviews and all these other opinions, but understand, you put all that aside because that's never going to sustain you. Those things are endless and vain philosophies, but will, what will help you is putting Christ as preeminent in your life. You elevate Christ. You, you live your life for Him. I'm telling you, He will do things above and beyond you could even ask or think Him to understand to do. And what Paul is asking these Colossian Christians, and I think what Paul and, and certainly the Lord Jesus is asking us to do here on this, again, final Sunday of 2018, is to submit ourselves. Now, I know that's a bad word, but submit yourself, not to any old thing, not to the next uh, uh, revelation that comes down the pipe, so to speak, but you need to submit yourself to the supremacy of Christ in your life. Now, this is not new preaching. <laughs> this is, I mean, it's, it's centuries old. But the problem is we don't do it. We're not doing it. We submit ourselves to all kinds of other things. And we're comfortable when it's other things, but we're not as comfortable when it's, it's us. So Paul gives them some instruction here about how they can submit themselves. And he begins, number one, by saying that the first step, if you will, is to reorder the priorities of your life. Re reorder those priorities of life. Now, look at verse 15 again, Colossians chapter number 1. Speaking of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church. Who is the beginning? The firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have the preeminence. Okay, so um, everything in my life begins with Christ. Right? In my Christian living, everything begins with Christ. Good. Everything then at the end of my life, everything ends with Christ. Okay? Now, let's just blow your mind. <laughs> if it begins with Christ and it ends with Christ, what should all this stuff in the middle be? Christ. Right? Well, I started um, being a Christian when I trusted Christ for my personal Savior, April... 20th, 1986, whatever your day is, right? You started here. It's going to end with him, everything in between. And here's what Paul is saying. He created all things. By him, everything consists. So you start and you end with me. Everything in the middle should be with me. And so he, he gives us this illustration, beginning in verse number 15, in speaking about Christ and his supremacy in creation. If, if Jesus Christ is supreme in all creation, and He is, then He should be supreme in my life as well. He created me. So, okay, I see. 
I go to the Grand Canyon, I say, man, look at the beauty that God has made. And I, I step out my, my, my back door and I take a picture of the sunrise or the sunset. And I say, boy, God sure brought out his paintbrush tonight. And I, I think of all these things where God is great in creation, but I don't apply that to my own life necessarily. God is great in what he has done in my life. Not because I'm something special in and of myself, but because he has made me to be something special because of what he's done in me. I am made to be a child of the king. I'm a child of God because of what he's done in my life. As many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so if he's supreme in creation, that's what Paul says here in Colossians 1, beginning in 15, then he ought to be that in my life as well. Look at what he says, verse number 15. He uses a word in verse 15 that he also uses in verse number 18, and it's the word firstborn. Now, when Paul uses the word firstborn in verses 15 and 18, it doesn't, it's not, he's not referencing time like you and I think about it, right? Uh, we think about our firstborn. Well, DJ is our firstborn because he's the oldest. He came first, all right? What Paul is, is using that term to mean is a, a position of place or status. Jesus was not the first being created. If Jesus is created, he is no longer God. So it's not like he is firstborn being first created. It simply means, again, as Paul is saying it here, he is of first importance. He is of first or highest rank in our lives. Um, do this. Turn your Bible. Hold your place in Colossians. I want to show you an example. Look at Psalm 89. Psalm 89. And look at verse number 27. Now I want you to see this in another place. Psalm 89 Verse number 27. Now, when you look at this passage, who is being spoken about in Psalm 89 is Solomon. Right? Solomon, the son of David. Now, question. If you know kind of your chronology and the, the offspring of David, was Solomon the firstborn in, in birth order? No. No, he wasn't firstborn in birth order, but notice what Scripture says in Psalm 89 and verse number 27. Also, I will make him my, what's the word? Firstborn. Higher than the kings of the earth. All right, yes, it is a reference certainly to the Lord Jesus Christ, but the, the direct context is of Solomon. Solomon was not first in the birth order, and so the phrase that the firstborn that is mentioned there in Psalm 89, that is back in Colossians 1, verses 15 and verse number 18, the firstborn of every creature simply means he's higher, of greater importance. So, Colossians 1.15, who is the image of the invisible God, again, who is Jesus Christ, the firstborn, the highest, of most importance, of every creature. John 1 and verse number 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Romans 1 and verse number 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He is supreme in creation. Now, your life is not all made up of Christ. I understand that. I think anybody who, who is, has any kind of common sense understands it's not just Christ in my life. There are a lot of things that make up my life, all right? So I've got uh, big pieces like a spouse and children and, and uh, you know, my, my job or, or rela other relationships, whatever. All of that stuff makes up life. But what Paul is getting at in Colossians 1 is that, okay, I have all these big picture things in my life, right? I've got big rocks, so to speak. But God didn't give Christ to just fill in the, the other spots of my life. He's not just something that I add into my life to say, well, I've got a few cracks here and a few little spots here. He's not just come to shore up those things. He has come to be my life. I cannot properly love my wife without Christ being in my life. I can't be the father for my children without Christ doing the work in my heart and in my life. One writer said it this way, Christ didn't come to warm the coldness of your life. Christ didn't come to fill up the small missing ingredients of your life. Christ didn't come to see where he might add some value to your life. Now, he might do those things, yes, 
But that is not who he is. He's much bigger than all of that. <sighs> I tend to look at that kind of stuff as, yes, they're, they're big items because that's right here in front of me. Right? I deal with my spouse or my children on a daily basis or I deal with my job on a daily basis or, or my neighbors or other family members or other relationships or my whatever is, is filling up my life. Right? All the stresses that I have, all that stuff, because it's, it's there day after day after day after day. Okay, then the question has to be asked, then why am I looking at or treating Christ like he does just fill in those spots? Maybe it's because my relationship isn't the way that it should be. Maybe I'm not seeing those, those big things as being from him or being him using those things in my life. See, those things are small in comparison to how Christ is supposed to be in my life. But I make those things to be big. And so I can um, be guilty of using my family to use it as an excuse to not be obedient to Christ. Well, we got real quiet. I can use job or um, let's just be real general like most people tend to be. I can use my responsibilities as an excuse to not be obedient, to follow what Christ would have me to do. Because I'm just, I'm fitting him into my life. And I'm telling you, we need to get tired of doing that. Just get tired of it. So I'm, I am not doing, I'm not living the Christian life I should be. And can I just be honest with you? I, I don't know that I could get it to two hands if I counted the number of people that I've met personally that I, I really got the sense they were living the Christian life they should be. And I'm not saying that to, to downgrade anybody. I'm just saying we're all in the same boat. Christ, he, he, he sets the boundary for all of creation. It's, it's no wonder why in the Gospels, Jesus can be awoken as he's asleep in the boat in the midst of a storm, be awoken by fearful disciples and say, Lord, don't you even care that we perish? And in a couple of words, he stops it. Peace! Why can he do that? Because he created it all. It listens to him. It is obedient to him because he created it. Okay, so if something like the wind or the waves obeys Christ, why doesn't his higher creation? <laughs> the ones who should know even better. Why don't we? Proverbs 8, verse number 29. I love this verse. When he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment. In other words, the water doesn't go farther than God says. You go to the beach and you dip your little gross toe into the ocean. The only reason it came up to where it was is because God said you're not going to go any farther than right there. That doesn't blow your mind like it did mine, I guess. Listen, if he can control that, don't you think he can help you with some of those aspects of your own life? Don't you think those trials and struggles and, and issues that you're dealing with personally, don't you think he can say, okay, enough's enough? Don't you think he can say to his child, child, I'm here. I know how far it's going to go. I know how long this is going to last. You stay with me. You stay faithful. You trust me. I will deal with that. But I want you to grow and be strengthened through this. And I want you to trust me and realize all of this, all of this, everything that you see, the things that you don't see or don't understand, by me, Christ says, all things consist. I hold all of this together. Global warming. He knows all about that. <laughs> he knows how to keep this globe spinning. Yeah. Yeah. Just mark it down. When it's time for us to go and spend eternity in heaven, He knows He'll bring it to pass. Don't fret about that. When world powers come together 
and they march against Israel or against Christianity, don't worry about that. He's not concerned by that. Well, does that mean we shouldn't take a stand? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you, you stay faithful to God. You put your trust in Him. He's holding all this together. Don't get all blown out at the seams and we get so worried and concerned and we have panic attacks over stuff that God says he, He's never worried or sweat a day in His life about that. And, and I say this as respectfully as I can. He, he's eternal. <laughs> he sees everything. And if that's true, what Paul is saying is, why don't you and I follow him better? Verse 17. He is before all things. By him all things consist. He orders and sustains the world. Without him, this world cannot stay together. So can I ask you just an honest question? How are you doing at keeping your life together? <laughs> well, I'm just... I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, how are you doing at keeping your life together? Doing okay? I mean, well, I mean, you know, I'm not perfect. You better, you're darn right you're not. And it's going to fall apart if you keep doing it in your own strength. He does a much better job at keeping your life together. We need to learn that Jesus Christ is all and that you and I are small in comparison. He's supreme in creation. Secondly, here's what Paul says. Christ is supreme not only in creation, but He's supreme in the church. Verse 17. Or at least He should be. Oh, maybe we're sleepy today. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. See, He shouldn't be an afterthought in our church service. He shouldn't be an afterthought in, in the church's activity. He should be first in everything that we do. Great theologian of years gone by, G. Campbell Morgan, said this, the church is useless without Christ. Without Christ, this church, Trinity Baptist Church, as nice as the folks as we may be, becomes a sham and a fraud without Christ. And it's the same thing with your life. So these false teachers are coming into the church at Colossae and, and they're causing trouble because they would never give Christ the, the place of superiority in their, their mindset. In their, according to their philosophy, according to their teaching, Jesus was just one of many representatives to get to God. Right? There, there are many ways to get to God. You, you can take from Christ what you can and use Him sort of as a, a rung on the ladder and you take the next step to the next step to the next step. Take His wisdom, add some to it, you'll be much better off in your life. He is not the only way to God. And so the main emphasis in the entire book of Colossians is all about the supremacy of Christ and the smallness, again, of you and of me. Verse number 18 again. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Notice, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That word preeminence is another great word. It means to be elevated or exalted. The ultimate or the absolute of something. The supreme of something. I've heard this statement and seen it rephrased, if you will, many different times. But it, it is true. If, if Jesus Christ is not Lord of all, then He cannot be Lord at all. See, I, I'm either yielding to Him and He's leading my life or I'm leading my life. He does not take um, backseat drivers. <laughs> oh Lord, you need to go here. Oh Lord, this is what you need to do. That's not how He operates. He'll let you have the wheel. But you're not a good driver. Christ is so much more than a plan B for your life. He's much greater than just some contingency strategy. Well, I'm going to live my life any way that I want to, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to make decisions to go against what His Word says and against what He would have me to do, and I'm going to blatantly sin in His face because I've already been saved. I'm, I'm okay. No, that's not how, how Jesus works. Here, here's a practical test. If you say... I would do anything for Christ, but, and there's a blank. I would do anything for Jesus, except then whatever fills that blank is what's supreme in your life. 
Or maybe think about it this way. I would do anything for Jesus if he would do... I would live my life. I would, I would give my life to God if he would just do whatever fills in that blank is supreme in your life. Is Jesus supreme in creation? Yes. Is he supreme in the church? Yes. He is. Is that how we're living our life? Not just reordering priorities, though, Paul says. If you're going to submit your, yourself to the supremacy of Christ, then not just reorder priorities. Not just, well, I'm going to come up with a new plan. You have to relinquish actual control of your life. And it begins in verse 17. He is before all things. By him all things consist. He's the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. That phrase, all fullness, is very similar. It means to be complete or, or filled to abundance. Now, what is interesting to note is that Paul is using the language of the Gnostic false teacher to, when he uses words like preeminence or all fullness. That word fullness and, and that definition, complete or filled to abundance, was used as a, a technical term in the vocabulary of the Gnostic teachers. And it means that the sum total of all the divine power and attributes. That their goal was to have supremeness or, or, or all fullness in just taking all the, the teaching, all the philosophy, all the worldviews, and making it all come together. And as you see on bumper stickers, coexist. <laughs> the problem is, is that the gospel of Jesus Christ does not coexist with anything else. It's much greater than those things. Where humanity has come up with its own idea, its own standard, its own morality, Christ would stand in opposition to that. Where it does not match with the Bible is where I should go away from it. It means, again, the, the, the sum total of everything involved. And so Paul says that this sum total, this, this fullness of all power that could ever be, dwells in Jesus Christ. It pleased the Father that in Him, in Christ, should all fullness dwell. And it dwells in Christ. That is, I love the phrase, it means to be at home permanently. All fullness, all power dwells in Jesus Christ. Everything I could ever have need of is found in Christ. So, when you elevate scholarship or, or elevate human wisdom to the level of Scripture or the level of Christ, the idea is that, well, you know, these people are, are good to listen to also, and, and we, without saying it, we can lift that person up to almost the level of a deity or of, of speaking truth as well when, when they're not speaking truth. Because we like their personality. We like what they have to say. And Paul is instructing these Colossians to, to empty themselves of everything but Christ. In fact, um, look across the page, Colossians chapter number 2. Look at verse 9. Similar phrase, chapter 2, verse 9. For in Him, again in Christ, in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete, how? In Him, which is the head of all principality and power. You want to be the person you can be? That happens only in Christ. That's what those verses are saying. And again, this is where we struggle. We like Jesus to be supreme in creation. Yeah, we, we want Jesus. We like Jesus when He's supreme in the church. But where we start to resist is when He wants to be supreme in our own lives. Because there are some things that, well... Jesus wants me to do or wants me to stop that I kind of like doing. There's some things that he wants me to do I don't really enjoy doing. And so, I, you know, I, I think Jesus wants me to be happy and God, you know, he has my, my best interest at heart. And so, you know, if I do this, really I can just, you know, say that I'm sorry anyway and he'll forgive. Is that, is that the sum total of Christianity? <laughs> Is that submitting yourself to the supremacy of Jesus Christ? No. That's submitting yourself to the supremacy of you. And you've made yourself to be like God. You, you struggle 
Because you don't get to do the things that you think you deserve to do. And there's part of the problem is we have pride. And I'm telling you, it's all over us. Christ is the complete revelation of God. He, Hebrews 1 and verse number 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And that word image that, that the writer used in Hebrews 1 and verse number 3 literally means an exact representation or revelation. Look at again, verse 15 of Colossians 1. Who is the image, there's that word again, of the invisible God. The firstborn of every creature. An exact representation and revelation. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glories of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. He looks just like His dad. If you've seen me, Jesus said, you've seen the Father. What would people say? What could they say? If they look at you, who have they seen? They see the Father? They see Jesus Christ living His life in and through you? Or do every once in a while they, well, I see, you know, maybe a little portion or something, but there are a lot of people who don't go to church that act like that. So you're going to be different if you allow Christ to, to be preeminent in your life. I'm in no position to decide what is best for my life. Because if Colossians 1, verses 16, 17, and 18 are true, and they are, then, then how dare I attempt to live life on my own, calling my own shots? Now, again, just think through the words of those verses. And... and, and Plug in verses like 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 31 where Paul said, I die. Anybody know how often? Daily. I die daily. To what? To self. To, to my own flesh. Okay. So I, I want to submit myself to the supremacy of Christ. Great. Then you've got to reorder some priorities in your life. It's just, you're going to have to do that. You're going to have to, to, to see some things that need to be dealt with and, and dredged out. And then you relinquish control of your life. And then, Colossians 1, verse number 20, then I rejoice in the meaning of my life. See, when I, when I relinquish my life to Christ, then my life takes on all new meaning. And I can rejoice in that. Verse 20, Colossians 1. Having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So I want you to think in your mind. and We're almost done. Think about the gospel. It tells us that we were much more wicked than we would have ever thought. But it also tells us that we are loved and valued much more than, than we could ever imagine. I'm a sinner, and I'm worse off than I could ever begin to say to you that I was. Because God knows everything about me, even the things that I forgot about or didn't know about. And yet, because of His love, He showers me with grace and His mercy. And, and more than I even think, I can love myself better than I can take care of myself. More than I can meet my own needs. God wants to meet those needs and, and dwell with me much better than I ever could imagine. He can take better care of you than you can. So stop trying to make it all work. Let Christ live in and through you. Yield yourself to Him. Because the only thing that the false teacher, the only thing that anybody else can ever offer you is the possibility to get, now listen, to get closer to God. Well, you can get closer. You can maybe draw closer to Him. But in verse number 20, I want us to understand what God is saying. You were the treasure that Christ left heaven for. He makes you to be a child of God. You are, the book of Romans says, a joint heir with Christ. You can dwell right now in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So are you? I know, it gets quiet and I get nervous when you get quiet. So, so think, think, think with me through this. 
Verse number 19. It pleased the Father. And remember Isaiah 53 and verse number 10. Remember what that prophecy says. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Who are we talking about in Isaiah 53? Jesus Christ. The Bible says it pleased the Father to bruise the Son. It pleased God to put His Son to grief. Why? Because He loves you. Because He cares for you. And so Colossians 1, it pleased the Father because of what the Son did for every believer. It pleased the Father then that in Him, in Christ, should all fullness dwell. Verse 20, to reconcile. I, I love that phrase. By him, by Christ, to, to reconcile, to restore to fellowship or friendship, to bring harmony back, to reconcile all things. Why did all this take place? To bring into harmony all things. For who? For you? No, for God. Wow, what an amazing, amazing thought. We read Hebrews 12 in the, the Sunday school hour. Let me just read again verse number 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, so according to that verse... What was it that enabled Christ to endure all the hardness of the cross and the events leading up to it and the pain and the suffering? What was it that enabled him to endure all of that? Well, Hebrews 12, 1 says, for the joy. It was joy that enabled Jesus to endure every hardness. So I got another question. Does joy help you to endure hardness? Mm. We're not so good at that, are we? Does the joy of knowing that whatever I go through, God might and does desire to get glory out of it in my life, D does that drive me? Does that help me to endure hardness? Or do I just put on a happy face? Because we're good at doing that. Do I just hide and say, Lord, I, I, if you just take this away, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame? How many things, according to this verse, how many things did Christ reconcile to himself in verse number 20. How many things? All things, right? All things. He won everything. He succeeded in his plan. You know what that means for you and me? It's okay when I fail because I'm God's treasure. Not when I go into it and do it willingly. He doesn't want me to do that. But when I'm... I'm, I'm serving and helping and, and trying to live the life God wants me to. And, and, and I get distracted and I get turned aside and, and maybe a besetting sin comes about. It's okay because I'm still his child. He doesn't just cast me off to the side. Why? Because he reconciles me back to himself time after time after time because he loves me and wants relationship with me. Shouldn't that motivate me to live more for him? I don't want to disappoint him. I want to live my life for him. I don't just want to walk the edge and say, well, I'm going to get as close to sin as I possibly can because I really want to enjoy life too. As if living for Christ is such drudgery that I have to interject bits of sin or pleasure into my life to just make it bearable. That is not the life God wants you to live. My self-worth. It's not determined by outward things. 
or outward relationships or outward acceptance. Boy, I, I wish more would get a hold of this. My identity is in Jesus Christ, not in what I accomplish on worldly measures. He reconciled me to a holy God. He's bought me. He's cleansed me. He's saved me. He's brought to me the possibility of joy. He, he enables me. He allows me, if I will let him, if I will submit my life to him, if I will worship him, if I'll humble myself, then what God says in this passage, he's not trying to keep you under his thumb. He's not trying to be an angry God or, or a vengeful God. What he says is, I love you enough to want you to be happy. I want to give you joy. Here's how to get there. Yield your life to me. He's made me to be kingdom worthy. And so Nehemiah would say, all the way back in the Old Testament, Nehemiah 8 and verse number 10, the joy of the Lord is your what? Your strength. He, he gives me meaning. What, what God does is he gives me completion. Chapter 2, verse number 10, and we're finished. Chapter 2, look at verse 10. Got a highlight already or a pen or something to mark that with? Ye are complete in him. Well, I'm just not complete without my kids. Baloney. You can love your kids and still understand you're complete in Christ. And by the way, you should. Young people, you're complete in Christ. Not in a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You're complete in Christ. Spouse doesn't make you complete, single person. Christ makes you complete. Married person, your spouse doesn't make you complete. I don't care what somebody in some movie line says. You're complete in Christ. Yeah. And so, where does victory over sin come? Well, victor, victory over sin comes when I'm dissatisfied with the sin I previously wanted to commit. And I gain satisfaction in Jesus Christ, Him living His life in me. But all too often, I'm more satisfied with the sin than I am with Jesus. And you're just like me. But verse number 19, it pleased the Father. It pleases the Father when I understand I need to reorder priorities in my life. I relinquish control of my life to Him. And then I rejoice in the meaning of my life in Christ and not in what I've done or what I can do. So grateful for He being supreme. Is that the life you live? Can be. You mean I can experience joy? Unspeakable. Full of glory. If you'll just... Just relinquish some stuff. Just yield your life to Him.